Um, so, uh, yeah, as Alex said, I uh, picked up Scala and played a while ago already. Scala was almost four, four years ago, okay, for uh, San Francisco is pretty much okay, but in Belgium I was like, I mean, a UFO. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, so they didn't really get into the functional programming, now even. Um, so, yeah, actually I'm doing a lot of Apache Spark in my daily work. So, because some people say that I'm a data scientist, I just say that I'm a mathematician. And um, at some point in time I was a bit, yeah, you know, Spark Reaper is really cool, but then you want to replace stuff, you want to show stuff, and then you're screwed. Your bosses or your client says, okay, what, what is this black thing with blank with the white letters i don't understand a word so please give me some charts okay so i didn't want to, to pick a tableau or all the tools like these so i asked bridgewater if there is a way to integrate spark into their scala notebook i left the issue open for two months and then i decided to pick it up and uh, now it has evolved so much that i cannot even merge it back mm. <laughs> so yeah um so i decided to pick the issue myself and then okay I, I created the spark notebook out of it and finally i i think that 80 percent of the, the code is now own uh, in my own code actually i evolved it so much it was based on uh, unfiltered and st stuff like these of course i migrated to play two and um, i changed the ui so i integrated so many stuff so today i won't show slides i will try to do my whole demo explaining um, what is Spark and how you can use it uh, through the notebook itself. So who knows about Spark here? That's great. Who worked with Spark today? That's really awesome. Okay, that's pretty awesome. Cool. So I'll try to give some detail about Spark. Actually, the thing that I would like to, to show first is how... Uh, okay, I'm not going to give any details about a notebook. If you want some, you just you can just ask me, but actually I find it pretty boring. So maybe you can just look at what you can do, you can do with the notebook. I, I guess that I should increase the. Is it okay like this? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. Cool. So yeah. So basically, what is a Spark notebook? It's just a, a web interface. So there was the. This kind of notebook um, um, talk recently uh, aired, so I won't give more detail about what is a notebook. It's just a, a freaking uh, HTML file, but this, this HTML file can uh, run code here. So behind the scene, I have my, my server running. Uh, here I display just the, the regular you know, uh, folders that I have in my uh, notebook's configuration. And OK, so maybe I can really start with a um, a simple example of Spark. The simpler that I can have is the 101 that I created out there. Um, so yeah, actually, maybe I can just say that this guy is just as BT run in the project. That's that's nothing else than just as BT run in the project. There are some distro in zip and and stuff like this, but you can run it from SBT rather easily. Anyway, so Spark 101, there are a lot of people already knowing uh, Spark, so I will go very quickly. So what I can do in the book is just load all my packages. But by default, actually, here, I just clicked on the notebook and actually behind the C, uh, if I don't misspell it, I have my Spark that has been started right away. So I didn't have to download the tar or whatever. I just have my, my Spark running by clicking on the, on, the, on the link in the notebook, okay? So I can have access to this UI. Of course, there is nothing because I didn't execute anything. So also the Spark jars are, uh, yeah, the Spark jars are already included in the project, so I can already load them. And then I can start looking at what I've, I'm trying to explain. Uh, okay. I move these things and now my computer is crazy. Okay, it's back. Take, try to, <laughs> to 
squeeze my, my, my knees. Um, okay, so I'm trying to explain what is Park. And to explain what is Park, the best is to have some text and some code, right? And here I have my uh, small mockup, uh, mockups that, come on. <sighs> okay, <laughs> enough now. Um, so yeah, so to explain Spark here, I explained what is a DAG, what is a job, etc., blah blah blah, and then I can run it right away and showing that actually when I trying to load a file from Spark, it's just defining how to load the file in Spark. It's not executing it, executing it. So I have a mapped DD there, and you see this mapped DD is actually a subtype of RDD of int. So RDD is for resilient da distributed data set. I guess that most of you knows about it. And a RDD is typed in this case, it's an int because I mapped all the string, all the lines into the file, the var syslog, the classical one, into its size. So finally I had this RDD of string that converted to a, a RDD of int. And then I can apply a distinct. However, nothing has been processed. So see, nothing has been processed. It started for uh, three minutes now almost, and then just did nothing. Okay, cool. Um, <coughs> oh. um, um, so this mapper DD is actually something that defines that he has to, it has to map over another DD and doing something with strings to an end. All right. Okay, cool. Um, so when I have this RDD, I can maybe group by, um, group by the last digit. Um, so we have, if I do a mod over 10, I will get the last digit of the size that I can group by. That means that I will have basically 10 items in my LDD, one for each uh, digit, and then it will um, map it to an iterable of int. So be really careful when you use group by in Spark because it can blow your memory really quickly. Um, so I, if I execute it, again, Spark is very lazy. Maybe is even more lazy than I do. And actually, you see, I have my shuffle there, DD. Why is it shuffling? Because I have a group by. Basically, if my syslog was really huge, I have to, to split it into HDFS. That means that I will have several partitions. And then uh, in order to blah, 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 OK, um, in order to have the digits for 0 that are coming from uh, all the nodes, I have to shuffle all the data to a single node and then having this iterable of int. Anyway, so I have my, my data grouped by digit. Um, everything is lazy, so I have my shuffled RDD, so um, nothing has been processed in the, in the, in the, in the background. Okay, um, even more functions available in Spark, I can map over the data, adding one, then taking the even out of them. That means I, I will leave the odd in the data. And finally, I can even create tuples with fancy computation that deserves nothing. Okay, um, so um, when I have these different RDDs, um, I can join them. Why? Because these are DDs. I can show the input by it in O. Actually, if you don't remember that it's O, you can hit H, and you will have an help. Uh, for the different uh, shortcut that you have. Okay. 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 One, two. One, two. One, two. So, um, all right. Since I have a mapter DD over int and int tuples, and the order there is a int iterable of int, I can join them, right? Uh, so it like inner join in the SQL. So uh, to join them, I can call join on one of them, and then finally Spark beyond the C will figure out how to join the keys uh, all together. Cool. Finally, I have my RDD of int, iterable int, that's the first RDD, and int is, is coming from the second one. <coughs> so now, the interesting part with the notebook is that you can print out some results at some point in time. So I have, if I want to know, show the first and result of the joiner DD, I can do it like this. So I will have my data in a, in a rather fracking string. But if I want to have something a bit more fancy, 
I can just return the list and I will have a table showing the list. All right? So what it shows is a tuple of X and Y, basically so it will show the first item and then the, the values is going to be the compact buffer of the, all the um, um, sizes that has been discovered into the file. And it's, I've been, it has been mapped by the last digit, that's, that's why everything is four, for instance, there. So 254 uh, and so on. So nothing really interesting, but still, you can show it really easily. It's better than in, in the REPL, actually. When I show that to someone, at least it has some sense. Oh, it's a table. Well, great. Um, anyway, so and something interesting with, our, uh, with Spark is that you can show um, what will be processed. So in the case of join, I can show what is the DAG that has been created behind the C. So actually, this is the thing that has been processed by Spark, and I can show in the job right now that something has been processed, finally. So I have these takes um, that are um, consisting of the distinct that I've declared before, the map of the sizes, the group by for the digits, and so on, and finally the take that has taken the data out of the, of the files, and the computation, sorry. All right. So we can debug a bit, uh, de debug a bit with the to-debug string. And uh, that's, that's pretty much OK. Now, uh, <coughs> sorry. Um, something in Scala that we like to have is types, all right? <coughs> so tuples is pretty interesting. But finally, we want to represent our data into something relevant and understandable. So if I want to manipulate some financial data, I would like to, define, I would like to be able to define a code class that will contain some stock date and price um, fields in it. And so I can declare them into my uh, REPL, into my Spark Notebook quite easily. So this uh, case class has been defined, defined. And then I can process some CSV file quite easily and, and map it to this, uh, to this case class. So how I can do that, I can show the content on a file or there. But this file is actually on Amazon. I should have on S3 actually, so I should have already locally. I hope. Oh, it's in TMP, so oh shit, I'm going to download it. Anyway, um, so what I can do actually here is that I can um, download some file from uh, S3 and then process it. But normally, I should be able to process it straight away from S3. But I have another example for that. Um, I hope that it's not going to take so much time. Otherwise, I'm going to be quite screwed. Um, I should have prepared this one. <laughs> um, yeah, see, 35 persons, 37, 40, 41, 43. 44. <laughs> OK, so it should be fine in a, in a few. Um, OK, the thing is that actually I, I, should, I could also just start another notebook while this one is running. And I, create so, I can show some visualization, if you like. Actually, there are some, several visualization that has been integrated into the notebook. One of those that has been integrated recently is a magic plot. And magic plots is something quite interesting for uh, data scientists that don't want to integrate anything from D3 or whatever. Actually, it's something that allows you to, to automatically show plots based on the type that you are returning. OK? So in this case, I have a, simply a sequence of doubles. So if I execute it, what it will return, it will return first the, ah, shit return the, um, the actual numeric range, but also is going to return a series of plots that has been created automatically based on the data that has been just returned, OK? Th there is a random on this microphone, I mean. And OK, um, so this is not only the, the, this is not the single graph that can plot on, on doubles. There is this bar chart, but also there you have the, the regular plot line, right? OK, that's fine for a list of doubles. But when you have something like pairs, what you can do with tuple of two, actually, you can plot something like a table, the regular table, of course. But you can also plot a bar plot with the, in the axis, you have the first entry in the tuple. And the second one is going to be the, 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 the value in the tuples. But of course, you can also have the, 
uh, the liner plot uh, based uh, that has been included into your into your. <coughs> uh, maybe I'll just hold the handheld and we'll cut off. But uh, which is your mic? Yeah, which is uh, yours? Okay. I want to turn off the the other one. Small. Okay, so let me. This one. This one. This one. Okay. okay, let's just get rid of it. Should have a back magnetism. Yep. Yeah. So <laughs> thanks you. <laughs> okay. Um, it's better now. I hope. Yeah. Okay. So that's for the tuples. Uh, but when you have a, a list of tuples for which the first item is not an int or number anyway, it's a string. Okay. In this case, I'm mapping over the characters and I convert it to a string, and then I want to print something that has been zipped onto this uh, list of uh, pair uh, of uh, even words, uh, even numbers. Sorry. If I written this guy, I can have the data, but also I will plot the regular table. And of course, when you have things with strings, we will have a pie chart, right? Because actually it's about strings and doubles, so come on. <laughs> <laughs> OK, now, um, so you have a pie chart. And uh, because, I mean, when you have a string, a double C, it should be printed into a, a, a pie chart, of course, right? It's categorical, categorical values. And since you have categorical values, you can also plot bar plots where the x-axis is actually the, the different libraries that you have. OK, that's cool with tuples. You can also show some different tuples with this fracking underscore one, two, three. But if you are fed up with these tuples because you are lost into your underscore one, underscore two, et cetera, et cetera, you want to have some types, actually you can define your own type. In this case, I created point class, which is actually a double int, basically, just a wrapper on two tuples, if you like. And if I have this kind of class, actually, I can use it to randomize, uh, to create a list of randomized uh, points like this. And actually, I will still have my table with A and B uh, as being the, the, the fields name, but also I will have the bar plots and the, and the, and the uh, linear plot, of course. OK, so because it's a, it's a type that contains only two things, a, a, a number and a number. So you can plot it like this. Um, if you want some category values, again, Create some with a lot of Chinese text because random string is always generating these. But anyway, anyway, even I understand the word of that, I can at least look at the pi. Sure. So actually this appears 19% and this 18 and this <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Apparently it's not uniform. OK, and I can also have this bar plot. So it has been inferred because we have a class that contains string and, and, and numbers. And again, for a random type, let's say, I can, I can create some tables out of it. And for now, we are working on a, on a way to click on the tables when we have a table like this with multiple entries. And, and uh, based on, I always speak louder. <laughs> So when we, we click on these columns, it draws automatically the charts. OK, so because the tables are fine, but if you want something more fancy, you need to do something. All right. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Uh, so these charts. Yeah. Uh, I remember Nathan Hamblin forked Scala notebook to add the graphs. Yeah. Is this something you also had to add, or is it that fork of his? Actually, I merged it uh -huh. on my, and then I completely refactored it. Got it. So actually, if I want to show some more plots mm -hmm. that using this um, um, uh, reactive programming patterns, mm -hmm. I can show maybe the rickshaw one, which is about um, some time series. And OK, I'm not going to show much, but actually I'm going to create some time series and, and a integrate the D3 uh, plots and something like this. Anyway, so um, what I will do right now, I'm going to create uh, a plot. So now I have my plot there. 
you see, just a regular time series plot with different things. But now I'm going to create several futures, right? I'm going to launch them every second or every two seconds, okay? No, it's two seconds, otherwise it's going to take much time. Okay, let's, let's stick with 10 seconds. And every 10 seconds is going to create a new, time, a new bunch of time series, and I will apply my new time series to the previous widget that I've been created, that I created just there, right? I have this P is actually a wrapper onto Rickshaw TS, Rickshaw TS being a, just a, a um, time series uh, plot, plotting framework. And when I apply a new time series to a widget, it's going to automatically listen to the data and then it will update it. So if I do that, in 10 seconds, you will see that actually it will just change. But this code, this future sequence, blah, 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 will be, run, will be running onto my server, onto the, actually to, onto the notebook uh, uh, process, and then it will be sent back by a WebSocket onto, until this uh, guy uh, picked it up. So in a few seconds, it should update, I hope. It should update it. unless Murphy comes in the game. <laughs> or Murphy is there. Okay, I'm screwed. Anyway, I have other examples. <laughs> um, you know what, I'm going to show it right now. i just show quickly what is the uh, Spark Core. Um, I still have my stuff there that I can show after, but I can switch directly to Spark, to Spark Streaming. Uh, do you know about Spark Streaming, how it works and so on? Okay, just create a bunch of RDDs out of a stream. Actually, I can show quickly a Twitter stream. And a Twitter stream, a basically um, well integrated into Spark because Spark is providing this, you know, the, 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 this line there is including a dependency, another dependency onto Spark Streaming Twitter, okay? So this is how you would define new, new dependency. And for now, it's going to use Maven to download the dependencies and then include it into the notebook. And also, it will include them into the Spark configuration in order to send them to the cluster. Um, but in the current, um, um, in the current, uh, in, no, sorry, in another branch, I have an SBT implementation. So I can handle both Maven and IV uh, repository. So this is how you would declare a local repository and how you would declare some dependencies like this and how you would exclude them because there is a minus, a dash before. So it will exclude them out of the, of the environment because actually they're already there. Okay, so if they are not in, already in my repository, uh, behind the C, it will download them, et cetera, et cetera. And the thing is that in Spark, you have to also include the dependencies into your Spark configuration, otherwise you will run into trouble into a cluster because they won't have the jars to be executed out there. So um, in some sense, um, this guy will add them to the Spark context. I can show it actually. So I have Spark context to debug to not the string to debug string. Ah, no, query. Uh, Spark context get off to debug string. There you go. So here we see in my jar configuration order, it included all the jars that I needed to should be shipped to the cluster. So it has been done for us. <clears throat> um, okay, so what I can do is just load my different keys from Twitter that I've actually, I prefer previously, I update, up, oh, sorry, I've run a script that creates my uh, environment variables that has been uh, uh, created before the spy notebook. So now I can access them straight away from the system environment and put it into my system properly. This is, this is how it goes with Spark Streaming for Twitter. And now I can create the regular streaming context onto the Spark context, and I want to have batches of two seconds. All right. And 
I can now create some filters. So I'm going to create the filters onto the, 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 the stream of tweets uh, for Spark, Scala, and Music. Why music? Otherwise, I won't have uh, <laughs> enough tweets for Spark and Scala to be shown. <laughs> so I've included music. And music means I, was, I would probably have also lol, ass, you know, and this kind of stuff. But anyway. So for the stream, it's fairly easy to create a DStream over tweets because the, there is this Twitter utils that comes from this, uh, you know, uh, this Spark streaming uh, Twitter thingy. I create the stream, nothing has been processed yet. Because it just, it's still lazy, it's just a stream. Okay, and then I can create, <coughs> I can map over and flat map over the status. I can take the status, which are Twitter status, get the tag split on, to, uh, split on the, the blank character and then filter everything that is not a uh, filter. First of all, everything is not starting with a, a hashtag. And then I'm just creating some fancy operation onto it, like, okay, I'm creating a tuples out of the word and mapping onto one, and then I can create a aggregated uh, summation on two different chunks of data, but for a period of 60 seconds. And I will basically turn it into Twenty seconds. Otherwise, we will have to wait for one minute. And um, so, yeah. And after I do some some transformation in order to have something relevant to show. And now there we are. There we are. I have this URL thingy there that creates actually a URL structure, a basic HTML URL structure. But also, it's a widget, and widget can be applied with a new bunch of data and and knockout, because this is the library that is used behind the C, knockout will listen to the socket, and when data are coming from the server, it will update, it, update the, the UL uh, uh, view uh, in the notebook. So now, from now on, I have just nothing. All right, but now I can count the top, uh, the top hashtag in the <coughs> Twitter stream. But since everything has been defined lazily in Spark, we don't see anything until I start the stream. All right? So at some point in time, you see every two seconds, you are going to have something shown in the UL. So it's processed on the server, and it's converted to some, some JSON things. It's sent over the WebSocket, and the knockout is picking it up and update the the uh, the widget automatically, so we see that actually, yeah, music is there on the top. Nothing about Spark and Scala. We can't be ashamed. And <laughs> okay, that's that's basically it with this um, with this kind of automatic uh, viewing. I don't know what's going on with this rickshaw thing. I have to to look at it. A quick question. Uh yeah. Okay. Um, Okay, that was for, for the, the viewing and the, and the streaming. Um, there are other things that are quite, in ah, wait, wait a minute, should, ah, yeah, we have the data right now. <laughs> so we can do something with that. So remember, we had this case class code, so I can now have my data out there. I can actually, I have another scope, SH, that stands for shell, and actually I can, some, I can put some shell uh, commands out there and actually there I'm just showing the, 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 um, the size of the, the, the file that I've just downloaded and you can see it's 174 uh, megabytes of text, right? Okay, that's boring, yeah? No, 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 I don't know <laughs> yeah, yes, it's, it is. <laughs> um, it's probably my fault, actually. Um, so, uh, so I can plug something like this. I can do, of course, ls. I will have my, my, my list of things anyway. Okay, so you, you got it, you basically got it, right? Um, <clears throat> so, um, all right. So what I will do on this file is that I will, I'm going just to read the file using text file on Spark context, okay? That's one of the reasons why I'm using all the time Spark, all the time, because I don't have to know, you know, file, new file reader and the path and then get lines and then whatever. I don't have to do that. I just have to have text file. That's more or less it, right? And furthermore, this 
this good guy will create some partitions out of it and it will process it in parallel. So I don't even have to bother with, you know, I love Akka, but I don't have to bother with Akka when I have to process a file. So it will do in, in parallel just for me, right? So it's very interesting to have it because I'm so lazy. And okay, so I have this text file out there. I can map on the, on the text on the different lines. I split by the comma because it's basically a CSV. And then I map it to a list. This list I recovered in a very untyped and very unsafe manner this way because I know that there, is, there are only three items in these files and I map it to a code, right? So, and I have my exception. So, um, no, 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 it's not an exception, sorry. It's just a, a warning saying, hey, it will fail at some point in time. No, now in the future because your case pattern is not complete. Thanks. Um, okay, so now I have a map RD, I have a map RDD, but it's simply a RDT of codes, my type, that I have just defined into the Reaper in some sense. All right. I can do some fancy computations, like I can key by the date. All right. So I have basically a string and code there. And then I can combine by key. It's, it's like reduced by key, but for, um, I mean, for who? For who wants to do it, actually? Actually, it's just a way to, to specify your own reduced by key by specifying how you will map each item on a local node, how you will process the data on a local node, and how you will reduce the data onto the different nodes. All right? So it's just a way to do reduced by key uh, in, a, in a more fancy manner. So when I have uh, this guy there, I can just print the result. It's going to be min by date. So um, here I'm just printing the minimum, the, the, the stocks that has the minimum price for a day. So for the 17th in, in, of October in 12, it was FRC and, and it was zero. And for max, of course, it's the same. Ah, yeah, what I wanted to show out there, if I can find back the right UI, is this one, right? So if I process this file li like this, okay, if I run it again, it will take another two seconds, right? So see, I have this take there that took two seconds, and this take there that took two seconds, that, yeah. But however, the computations are exactly the same, right? Uh, so Spark is not helping us in this, in this case. Well, may, wait a minute. Actually, Spark is there because it's so useful using the memory. So here, it didn't use the memory. I computed something, and then I had to recompute some, uh, the same thing again um, um, without any caching. So what I have to do now in order to be able to run it, run this code several times without having to spend my time or waste my time. I can define now a max by date, so it's just the reverse, and I can cache it over there, right? Shit. So I can cache it there. That means that actually, when the first time it will run, all right, it will still take two seconds, all right? But the second time there is going to take only nine milliseconds. Why? Because my data has been partially put into the memory. I asked Spark to put my data, the processed data so far, into the memory. In me so it, since it's in memory, ca um, Spark can directly process it and return it without having to do anything within the file whatsoever. And why only 17 percent? Because I didn't process all the data. I just asked for, <coughs> sorry, for, um, for two items. So. So you process part of it and then it, it uh, put it into, into the, 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 uh, the cache. All right, so we did something with data, that's cool. Um, of course, if you don't want to do this, you can simply return the list and we will have this fancy bar charts. So um, since we only returned two of them, we have this clear cut 50% one-on-one. -on -one. Um, okay, so what could I show? Ah, yeah, you know what? I'm going to show some SQL. Who loves SQL? 
I love SQL. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, okay. Um, so SQL is yeah one of the API that has a tired a lot of people coming from different world, and um, I'm going to show some stuff what we can do with SQL out there with the, mainly with the, what has been integrated into the <laughs> to, to the to the notebook. So again, I have this code class. All right. I can define some stuff to connect to S3, right? Then I can do some stuff like this, okay? I can connect to S3, I can provide just a path to my data. So rather than having to download it like before, I can just point to it on S3. And what I will do again, I will split on the comma and then return as a code. But after, I will persist it on the cache. I will cache it locally on my local file system. Uh, why? Because I don't want to pull the data out of S3 all the time, right? So in this case, I will persist it, which is more or less a cache, but on disk only. So you have like, you have several um, uh, options for storage level. Uh, you have memory, memory um, serialization. Um, you have different kind of cache system in Spark that can help you. You can even cache it serialized in memory, replicate it, replicate, it, replicate it twice, something like this. And also you can name, all right, you can name your, um, your uh, RDD. In, in, in this case, you will have in your Spark UI a name for the cached RDD, so you can recover, recover your pieces. All right, so now I can play with my data on S3, and I will play with it using SQL, all right. So for that, I have to, deplay, to, to, to declare this SQL context built onto the Spark context. And I will also import this create schema RDD in order to have uh, more inter interpolation in my data. Okay, I create in this context, now I can register the, co the, 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 the new <coughs> RDD, you know, this code there is an RDD, all right? And I can register it as a time table into the, Spark, the, the SQL context. And the timetable will have the name codes, all right. And now, I have this table, I can do some SQL queries on it, right? And for this, I have a specific context, uh, dot SQL, and behind the, be, um, between the brackets are there, the, the angular bracket, um, the, the square brackets there, I can specify a name for the written value. I will show it right now. So I can execute it, so I can show some stuff happening. Uh, wait, after. Um, actually, the, so this SQL is only selecting the dates and the count of um, the date and the count for a filter data. So I'm going to filter codes by specifying a particular date and a particular price that I want to filter on. And I will finally group on the date. Okay, so the group is going to be applied on the, uh, the, the count is going to be applied on the group data by date. All right, so I can create this one. I got what it created is just a simple form, all right, there, where I can specify some data, like this. And now, oh, okay, actually it detected that there is a change, though it tried to compile the SQL, but actually it misses something. So actually the SQL is not compiling. So it says before, um, behind, um, sorry, below that actually it failed to compile the, the, the SQL. Actually it misses a date somewhere, a price, sorry, somewhere. So I can put maybe something 1,000. One, 1, and then, okay, right now it's, it, create, it detected the change and then it created my schema RDD out of this SQL with the uh, date string uh, included into it and the price that has been replaced as well. And finally, I, 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 I should have something out there. Yeah. Uh, ah, yeah, S3 is working against me. It's pulling all the data from S3 and then it's, it's a bit slow, I guess. Maybe I can, yeah. Maybe, you know what? I can clear it out and I will cheat a bit because 
since I downloaded it there. I don't need this one anymore. Ha ha ha. So since I have it, I can I can use it right away there. And there, 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 and every if everything is fine, I still it should have updated. Yeah. Is doing the work. So now it wor it's working. I have my schema, and normally this guy sh should show some stuff right there. All right. So if I maybe put, I should have another job that has been started uh, somewhere. Uh, somewhere? Yeah? Now? Yeah. Okay. So it's pretty reactive because you know changes, events are sent all over the places, and and behind the scenes, the Spark SQL is is handling its own uh, stuff. So we can see it right there, uh, right there. So we see here all the tasks that has been launched, and etc. That's the that's the output, the, the logs for the for the Spark notebook. Okay. So this is how you could play around with the with this uh, SQL by generating some force out of some form uh, out of the uh, SQL itself, and actually, yeah, the byte date there has been mapped to a, a local value on which you can react. So that means that react the react things there um, takes a functions that will uh, produce a new output based on the RDD there. So I will collect the data, then to list and to string, yeah, I will output it into a simple pre-tag. Pre okay. Um, okay, so SQL, the cool guy. Ah, and if we process some GitHub data? You know, actually GitHub is producing some uh, archives and these archives are containing basically events between users, repo, um, and actually so you know you have a user that pushed into a repo, so you will have an event into this archive saying, okay, this user pushed even to this repo. So actually what you have, you have a graph of user and repo being the nodes, and the edges are actually the event between the two, okay? So you can process this guy. Um, I'm going to take this one otherwise. It's going to download the internet. Come on. Okay. So what I will do, I will use graphics. And graphics is a graph API, uh, part of the uh, Spark uh, environment let's say ecosystem. So now I'm going to declare this uh, particular um, uh, dependency out there. I will remove what I don't need. And then I will also include Jackson because actually GitHub had the wrong ID to publish this data in JSON. Um, I will download it. It's not that big. This one is around, I think, maybe I have already downloaded it. I don't know. Let's see. Yes, I have it. So there, I just downloaded it and just um, uh, unzip it and put it into a regular temp file. So I have it. Uh, I can show some uh, some lines of it. So see, JSON. Why JSON? I don't know. Um, so actually, there are two, two ways to handle JSON files in Spark. You can just use text file, and then you will have an access to the lines. And, but there is also, in SQL's context, a JSON file that can already handle the, the lines as being JSON. And you create the schema and so on, but it's not the purpose of this, this one. But still, you, at least you know it now. 
So you have this text file being written uh, right there, and you can count how many uh, events you have. It's 1,300. And what, what I'm going to do is just parsing all this data per partition, because I need to create a mapper. I don't want to create a mapper per items. So I'm going to create one mapper per partition since I will have fewer partitions than items. And I'm going to map it to uh, the, the, the types that I want to, to deal with. And all right, so I can take the two first items and showing that actually now I have a, well, OK, so we have things that has been mapped from uh, this, um, this JSON object out there, this is mapper. Actually, we picked the, we picked the object from map anyway. Okay, so now the the interesting part is how to deal with this data and graphics. I'm going to import all the inform all the package that I need that said um, that are gra RDD and graphics. And now I'm going to process the data by creating RDD of vertices, which contains all the information coming uh, all the information. Um, of the act of the actors, that means us as uh, GitHub users, and the repos that is our that are our repos, right? So I'm just parsing the JSON and picking the IDs of the actors and the repo. I'm going to create a union of these guys in order to have my vertex RDD. That's it. Okay, that 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 will be the nodes in my graph, right? And now. Since a graph is not only nodes, we need edges. I can create the edges by, again, reading this file and extracting what type of event occurred between these guys, the actor and the repo. And I'm creating the, the, um, bilat the, um, ah, sorry, um, the um, bilateral edges. So I'm creating in one sense in the other. Because what I'm going to do, what I'm going to do, I'm going to I try at least is to detect um, um, communities into the op open source world. So using a graph and a simple uh, algorithm like connecting component, okay, you can already detect some, I mean, very dense um, uh, communities in a graph. So this guy is going to run the algorithm for me. So now it's going to take the vertex and process them, uh, a lot of group bytes and stuff like this. Um, I hope it's going to take quite some time, it looks like. Hmm. Takes quite some time. All right. OK, see. There we go. So it's done. So now I have my connected component. OK, so what is a comp connected component? It's a, it's a subset of the vertices that are connected in some way. So there is a path between uh, all pairs in this, in this sub subset of the vertices. So what I can do is trying to detect, to, 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 um, to show these groups. And for that, I'm just manipulating a bit the, uh, the, uh, the results. In, in this, send, in this um, count, you see the number of connected components. It's a lot of connected components. Why? Because I, only t uh, I took only one hour of data in GitHub. That means that I don't have that many data out there. Right? I just have what, 7 megs of data, uh, 11,000 uh, um, even, so it's not that much. So that means that everything is rather decoupled. So guys from Erlang are committing, guys from, JS uh, from JavaScript and so on. So a lot of connected component has been created. Anyway, I can try to show um, some clusters. So if you want to look at the code, I can explain it, but it's not really worthy. It's just manipulation of the vertices and the edges in order to detect uh, what are the vertices? Uh, what are the, the connected components? Sorry, I can show. This is just a simple, uh, uh, sorry, a simple uh, visualization. And now what I can do based, based on these two calls, I can cluster. So what I will do, I will try to detect which uh, names contains, for instance, the GS 
uh, characters, this JS string, and then I will say, okay, all these guys are grouped into, um, I, I return the connected component, and I say everybody has been uh, part of the same cluster. Okay, so now I'm trying to, to fetch all the data from the graphs and co collecting all the data in a graph, in a graphic manner. So normally behind the C, you should have launched some collects, yes. Oh, there. And finally, I can show the result being a pie chart of the, of the information. But actually, the layout may, must be a bit better there. Because now, I have my clusters in a, in a better way. That means that I have this repo order. And I highlighted those ones that I contain in GS and see flowchart GS. You have uh, Angular GS. You have all these clusters that have been created out of the GitHub events only, right? I didn't do anything than just that, just collecting the data. And um, we can do it also for Scala. Yeah. Normally, I, I have also the, <laughs> I, I try to, to keep it short. Actually, it has only 70 minutes of battery, so. <laughs> um, yeah, normally after that, I, want, I wanted to show some machine learning stuff and, uh, and some uh, other thingies, but I will try to keep it short. Well, what I will show after this one is a more elaborated, a more elaborated um, uh, project using Akka. Kafka, Zookeeper, and, and Spark Streaming, and the Spark Red Book. All right, so here's this for Scala, so you see that there are fewer repos, and those repos are, come on, dude. Um, so yeah, you see, the, so Scala Z has only two, uh, uh, this guy, OX414C, has committed to two different projects, being Scala Z and Patterns. Um, you know, yeah, several small groups has been created. So not that many commits has been uh, done during this hour, but at least we have the connected component that has been created out of the data. So we, if we would have more data, we would have more uh, relevant clusters. All right, so, so we can print tables as well. So the thing is now, we could have a more elaborated example, like, you know, uh, trying to, so there is this Oanda uh, um, service. It's basically a service that provides uh, stock, stock market options and stock uh, uh, codes actually and something like this. So what we can do with this data, we can try to start a Docker environment. Actually, it's already started. And what, how it is started, actually, I, cre I created a zookeeper uh, a Zookeeper uh, Docker file, a Kafka Docker file, and there is another application that is this Akka, um, um, Akka small code that takes the data out of the pulse, pulse actually the service, and puts the data into Kafka. And now I will show how to connect to Kafka and uh, trying to have some more information about the the um, uh, interaction between uh, U US dollars and Euro, for instance, because it's basically what it produces. So if my battery doesn't run out. Um, so see, we had the Spark streaming, um, uh, the Spark streaming for Twitter, and there is also the Spark streaming for Kafka. So it's rather easy to connect to Kafka and start putting data out and creating some stuff with it. Okay. Um, so I uh, will have to, okay, now the gun, I have my, my jars. I can create a streaming context. I will connect to my Docker local bridge, okay? Where is the uh, Kafka running? Um, and then I can, I can simply um, start listening to Kafka and how I do that. Kafka utils create stream, and then I provide all the thrift types because actually when we when I put into the data into Kafka, it has been put into a 
uh, using the Trift, a Trift model. So actually it's a binary uh, uh, stream that I have in Kafka and then I can read it back using these types which are uh, Trift decoders. And then I'm going to take the ticks out and uh, return as a one that because I want to, to, to count them. All right, so this is how you would connect to Kafka. And since now we have a Kafka stream, we can try to output some stuff. I hope there will be some events because we are quite late, so maybe the market are already closed. And actually, if I run this, here I'm just fetching the data out, which are Trift items, and then I take <coughs> the count of the uh, RDD because streaming is is chopping the stream into server. Uh, um, the stream is chopping the, the data into server RDD, so I can count for a particular RDD. Uh, how many items there, there, there was there, there were there, and then I can take only one uh, those instrument that matching this uh, string, and I will map it on map it onto uh, price, and then compute the average and print it into this um, to this uh, widget order. So in order to have it running, I have to start the sparse the sparse streaming con context. Otherwise, it's just lazy and doesn't do anything. And if there are some, yeah, there we are. So we have uh, a one, the initial count was um, 1,000 items that was returned by the polling uh, behind the C. And, okay, no, nine only. Then six were uh, about Euro and USD. And actually the conversion rate is now 106. Mm -hmm. So it computes the average onto the old ticks. So the seven ticks is maybe one one and uh, uh, oh nine, but there we return just the, the average. Do you see the euro drop to dollars right now, right? No? Yeah, actually zero, zero, zero. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, that's basically it. I think I run out of time now and battery, so. I can stop the context. All right, um, I, can, I can help you out now. <laughs> thanks, thanks a lot. <laughs>